Another story making the news today is the sixth international conference by Dar al Ifte, Egypt's religious jurisdiction authority, wrapping up its session today. The two day conference is held under the auspices of President Abdel Fattah al Sisi and under the umbrella of the General Secretariat for Fatwa Authorities Worldwide. The conference, titled Fatwa Authorities in the Digital Age, is attended by senior state officials and a number of scholars and religious jurisdiction experts. The closing session announced several recommendations and announced the first ever collaboration between Fatwa Authorities Worldwide. The conference also discussed cooperation mechanisms between Fatwa Authorities to achieve common goals and to take part in tackling digital development challenges. These were a couple of the stories making the news today, but now turning our attention to our main topic tonight, which is uh, Egypt reaffirming its position among the Afro-Asian countries. Let's check out this report and we'll be right back. Egypt plays a vital role as a main pillar for preserving stability in the Asian Arab region. In this respect, the country is exerting sincere and tireless efforts to mobilize international support for Lebanon at all levels in light of the continuity of hard challenges the Lebanese people are facing, especially at the political and economic levels. Within the framework of the firm historic relations linking the two countries, which are based on solidarity and brotherhood, President Abdel Fattah Sisi has affirmed Egypt's support to the political path of Lebanon, aiming to restore stability in the country and tackle current challenges. The president highlighted the need for concentrated endeavors to settle any disputes in terms of government formation's efforts in order to get Lebanon out of the current state it is suffering from. This comes through setting priorities in Lebanon's national interests in a way that preserve the resources of the Lebanese people and their national unity. President Sisi voiced Egypt's keenness on the safety, security and stability of Lebanon and the Lebanese national interests as he received in Cairo the Lebanese Army Commander General Joseph Aoun. El Sisi expressed Egypt's appreciation of its firm relations with Lebanon on the official and popular levels and hailed the principal role of the National Lebanese Army has carried out to protect the stability and balance in Lebanon. For his part, the Lebanese Army commander conveyed greetings of Lebanon's President Michel Aoun to President Sisi, stressing Lebanon's keenness to enhance its firm historic relations, gathering both countries and expressing appreciation to Egyptian efforts to support Lebanon in all fields. The meeting tackled means to enhance bilateral cooperation framework and benefit from the Egyptian experience in many fields. During his meeting with Jordanian Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Foreign Affairs and expatriates Ayman Safadi in Cairo, President Sisi voiced Egypt's keenness on boosting relations with Jordan at the economic and commercial levels to serve interests of the Egyptian and Jordanian people. He lauded efforts exerted by the Jordanian government to provide all possible support for the Egyptian community. For his part, Safadi expressed Jordan's keenness to make use of Egypt's expertise in the field of development projects in light of the mega-national projects being established in the country. They emphasized the need for strengthening economic relations and increasing trade exchange between the two countries in the coming period, in addition to promoting mutual cooperation to combat the coronavirus pandemic. They also called for building on the outcome of the last summit held in Baghdad last June between Egypt, Iraq and Jordan to take serious measures to increase aspects of coordination among the three countries, especially in the fields of energy, electricity and industrial complexes. The two sides also tackled the situation in Lebanon, Syria and Libya, as well as the latest developments in the Middle East peace process. Safadi praised the tireless efforts exerted by Egypt to consolidate the ceasefire between the Israelis and Palestinians, as well as the Egyptian initiative to build the Gaza Strip. 
The two sides also expressed the need for intensifying international efforts aimed at resuming negotiations to settle the Palestinian crisis based on the resolutions of international legitimacy. They affirmed intensifying efforts at the international level to establish the peace process and resume negotiations to settle the Palestinian crisis based on the international legitimacy resolutions. Sisi voiced aspiration to enhance bilateral relations in a way that contributes to achieving interests of both countries and people, especially at the economic and commercial levels. Cairo has been in constant contract in an effort to stop the hostilities as the country played a critical role in brokering a ceasefire between Israel and Hamas in Gaza. Intelligence chief Abbas Kemal and Foreign Minister Sema Shukri began their mediation efforts with the Palestinian group Hamas in the opening days of the conflict. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, and we're joined here tonight in the studio by Dr. Sharif Amir, the Professor of Geopolitical Affairs at Paris University. Dr. Amir, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Uh, Dr. Amir, I mean, we're talking about Egypt reaffirming its relations with the uh, Asian continent as a whole, but also mainly the Afro-Asian countries. And when we talk about the uh, Afro-Asian countries, so many countries, so many files, but Let's start off with Lebanon, because Lebanon is, is already going through uh, a, a political turmoil that's been going on even for about a year now, exactly, since the uh, port bombing mm -hmm. in uh, Beirut. Trying to form a government, trying to have uh, a prime minister, the latest of which was uh, Hariri, who, who stepped down, and now uh, Najib Mekati is assuming uh, this position. How successful do you think he might be at actually forming a government and getting the country back together? Well, I think that what's taking place in Lebanon is not something new, but it's alarming this time. Mm -hmm. um, I think that uh, the Prime Minister McCarthy will have very, very tough task mm -hmm. because he was appointed by uh, uh, President Michel Aoun and we all know that the other factions, whether the Prime Minister Hariri at that time, they're all against his policies. Mm -hmm. So I think that uh, there is a, par a paralysis inside the country. Um, we have seen uh, some um, armed confrontations uh, lately um, in, in, in Lebanon, in, in a part called Khalda, and there was a young man who was killed, and then the whole uh, communities started fighting each other. I think that uh, the army is trying to try to see how to control the situation. But there is something very interesting in all that is that the problem is about money and money is there but no one wants to introduce the money. Mm -hmm. So that means that it is being done in purpose. There are some factions who are trying to show that they are the main factors there. Uh, we have seen the Hezbollah who tried to show that they control the situation. They said even the gas, the oil, I mean, would come from uh, Iran mm -hmm. uh, freely and it didn't work. So I think that um, Lebanon is heading to a point that will change the core the, uh, of history of this country. Mm -hmm. Well. When Saad Hariri actually stepped down, uh, there was an uproar among uh, the Lebanese people. Would you say that he had uh, at least a, the full backing of the Lebanese people? Because this is what it looked like. Let's be frank. Mm -hmm. In Lebanon, there is no full backing because of the community and the sectarian differences. Mm -hmm. so, so it depends only if some of the uh, factions will say, for example, the Maronites mm -hmm. will say we will stand with Hariri. Mm -hmm. But even though things are not clear because the Hezbollah and the Iranians and even the Greek Orthodox community there mm -hmm. and the Armenians are siding with this part, with mm -hmm. the Hezbollah, siding with Iran. 
uh, the other part it means Saudi Arabia mm -hmm. so there is a huge difference between these two parts mm -hmm. Lebanon is the, 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 the hub of all the interest of outside countries mm -hmm. since the 1970s and even when there was Hafez al-Assad in Syria and Saddam Hussein in Iraq and both were the, from the Ba'ath uh, party they were fighting each other in Lebanon mm -hmm. so I think that uh, we are um, witnessing a new form of uh, recreation of Lebanon but we are witnessing the downfall of the structure, the, the infrastructure, because as I said, the solution is there. And as the French said and the EU said, we have the solution, but no one wants to apply it. Why? Since last year, August 4th, yes. 2020. And imagine that the same port that was destroyed, it, nothing was changed since then, 12 months. We know there was the, the COVID-19 and everything was still, but mm -hmm. nothing was touched. Everything as is still the scene is, is, is the same. So mm -hmm. I think that Lebanon now is trying to uh, figure out how they will find a compromise to separate the communities afterwards. Because it seems that the problem is the president mm -hmm. and the president is not willing to leave. And I'm saying that the factions or the political parties are not, not willing to give any solutions uh, until he leaves. Yes. Well, what about Najib Mekati then? I mean, he was prime minister twice yeah. before. Do you think that a third time lucky can, can be a, an option on the table? I mean, what can he do uh, now that can actually solve the problem is it is it still in his hands is it it is it still an option how was the his his twi his two terms as prime minister how were they viewed uh, before that actually gives michel Aoun, um a confidence uh, i mean in najib miqati to actually succeed where previous uh, prime minister designates failed well, he has experience, mm -hmm. but in this situation, is experience sufficient? I don't know. Uh, I think that uh, uh, Prime Minister Hariri, the fact that he got the offer and he declined, that means there is something uh, in his intention and in the, in the mind of, of Saudi Arabia also. Uh, it's, uh, let's say it clearly. This is the main confrontation between Iran and Saudi Arabia on mm -hmm. the land on the soil of Lebanon mm -hmm. and even in the in the in the Sunni uh, se uh, sector it means that Najib, Najib Mukati was a Sunni but he has differences with uh, Rafiq al uh, with uh, uh, Saad al Hariri is this will be the um, the solution that um, President Taun saw that he will bring someone who has experience will find a solution for the country's crisis. I think that no, mm -hmm. I won't be uh, uh, that optimistic because from what we have seen last month, something is wrong inside the country. Mm -hmm. the, there are many factions who want to, uh, let's say, make the other faction weak. And, mm -hmm. I, and I mean by that to be clear, there is a uh, strong um, chance that the Hezbollah could be weakened and I think that many countries in the region are watching carefully what's going on because once the Hezbollah will be um, pulled into a confrontation inside Lebanon and mm -hmm. it has its forces inside Syria it will be very easy for Israel at a certain time to do as they did in the 1980s when they said it was the chaos in Lebanon, we have to go and make the, the call, they called it the Peace of Galilee in 1982 mm -hmm. operation, and they went in there. So uh, I think that many countries now are waiting for the Hezbollah to be very, very shaky, and then things will change. Mm -hmm. So Najib Mukati, um, he has the experience, but he doesn't have the tools this time. Yes. Well. Dr. Amir, you've mentioned that the solution is actually there. The money is actually there. Mm. Now, 
Najib Mekati is, is a media mogul and he's considered one of the richest people of Lebanon, if not the richest, which could mean that it could be an advantage for him making uh, and breaking deals, uh, having the, uh, the business guts in order to, to get in and start taking money out or start putting money in or facilitating and moving the money. I mean, he's not a, a reluctant, maybe a financially reluctant uh, politician. So, and having Lebanon in such um, uh, a dire financial uh, and economic state, does that really uh, give him the, the green light to actually make bold moves and maybe get it back together? Well, um, I, I adopt a theory that politics controls money, not, not money controls politics. Mm -hmm. He could have all the money, but if he has uh, strong uh, opposition, he won't be able to act as he wish. Mm -hmm. Well, he's not Donald Trump of Lebanon, but let's yeah. say that even Donald Trump mm -hmm. couldn't manage to have his second term. Yes. So, uh, if it's about money, it could be solved very easily like that. But I think that the one who has the money, and let's speak uh, frankly, mm -hmm. those who have the money always are guided by interests of those who govern other countries. Mm -hmm. We all know that uh, everyone who invests in, in, inside Lebanon are, even with Saudi Arabia, always Iran. And if they have the green light, the green light was come, would come from outside Lebanon. This is the problem of mm -hmm. Lebanon. Yes. It's not about who has the money and he could find a solution. Mm -hmm. And if he will try to find an independent solution, we have seen what happened to Rafiq al-Hariri. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, let's talk about Egypt and Lebanon. They obviously have uh, deeply rooted historic uh, relations. We've seen the, uh, the aid that Egypt has sent uh, right after the, uh, the port explosion mm -hmm. on August 4th and also during the coronavirus and all of that. And also, quite recently, President Sisi received the commander of the Lebanese army. Now, where does Egypt stand regarding what's happening in Lebanon? What, do they want, what does Egypt want to see? What does Egypt, what can Egypt actually do, if anything, to get them back together and maybe successfully form a government? Well, look, I will uh, look uh, at the situation in the whole region, not only in Lebanon, to explain what uh, Egypt's position towards Lebanon. There were three points in the, in tr it's a triangle. After uh, Donald Trump left the administration, the, the presidency of the United States, three countries were about to just be changed forever. Mm -hmm. Jordan, what we have seen was the, the attempt coup of mm -hmm. uh, uh, Crown Prince Hamza. Then Tunisia, and we have seen how Qais bin Said acted quickly mm -hmm. before the country would, and Lebanon. Mm -hmm. These small three countries were about to change forever and would, it were the keys of changing the whole Middle East. And Egypt is in the middle, if mm -hmm. you look at the map. Egypt is, that's why President Sisi contacted King Abdullah of Jordan and mm -hmm. we stood was our brothers there to stop the chaos taking place. It was at the last minute. Mm -hmm. Everything was prepared. The same thing with Tunisia. Mm -hmm. The country was devastated by the COVID-19, no solution, corruption, and another party was destroying the country. Mm -hmm. And then Kai Said came to Egypt. He spoke with President Sisi, and we have seen the bold actions that saved Tunisia mm -hmm. a few days ago. And now the same thing is happening in Lebanon, but Lebanon is the most compl complicated mm -hmm. because of the factions, of the foreign interest. Um, I think that Egypt uh, is very alarmed by the presence of Iran in many Arab countries, as you said, the, Aero, uh, the African, the, the Arab, uh, Asian countries mm -hmm. in, the, in the Gulf. What took place in the Gulf of Oman two days ago, uh, the drone who attacked uh, the, 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 the 
petrol, uh, the, the, I mean the ship mm -hmm. that transporting the oil, this is unacceptable. Yes. The attacks of the Houthi against uh, uh, Saudi Arabia also. So I think the same thing is happening in Lebanon. How come a country that is facing a, a, a economic uh, problem, a party, and I mean a party, not a government, says we will call another country who would come and help us. Mm -hmm. I mean by that Hezbollah and said we will call Iran to come and give us the oil and the food and the medicine. Who is Hezbollah and all that? It's just a party. How come they have the keys of solving the problem of the country? So I think that President Sisi, when he met the head of the Lebanese army, the message is clear. Mm -hmm. You have a duty as uh, to, to fight for the people as the armed forces in Egypt fought for the people when the people said enough in, in June 30th, uh, 2013. So I think that the message is clear. He's giving the advice. As we give the advice to Khalifa Haftar to, to fight terrorism, uh, we give the same advice to, uh, um, uh, in, in Sudan, mm -hmm. to the government there, to the army. So I think they have to uh, assume their responsibility act as a force that will change uh, the facts on the ground. The problem, there is two problems in the Lebanese army. First of all, the shortage of the arms, because we all know that Hezbollah is, mo is more powerful, of course. Mm -hmm. The second part is, the, f the second problem is the sectarian problem inside the army. Mm -hmm. This is what happened in Iraq, and this is what happened in Syria. And as the tribal problems, what happened in, in, uh, in Libya. So uh, I think Egypt is trying to, to give a message to the Lebanese people and to the Lebanese state, be aware you are in the same zone like Jordan, like Tunisia, and now it's Lebanon and this triangle. So we are working very carefully with them mm -hmm. because we have to as, uh, ensure that Lebanon has its sovereignty preserved and that Saudi Arabia and Iran won't be pushed into a confrontation that will destroy the whole country. Yes. Well, uh, one last question about uh, Lebanon, but let's imagine that the worst case scenario, uh, Najib McCarthy fails at forming a cabinet. What happens next? Does Michel Aoun assign a, or appoint another prime minister, designate, or do you see maybe the European Union and countries such as France maybe taking a closer step or interfering or trying to change things themselves? There is a third worst scenario. The, uh, the fighting could, could, could flare yes. everywhere. Mm -hmm. Every Lebanese home has arms. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I think that's very scary because uh, we could all be focused on the round tables, on the conferences, mm -hmm. and then someone mm, fires a bullet and everything goes wrong. Yes. So this is what happened in Lebanon in the 1975 uh, <coughs> civil war. It started mm -hmm. like that. So I think that if Najib Mekati would, would fail to create a, a government, and I think he will create a government, but it won't find a solution. Mm -hmm. This is what happened. So I think that at that point, uh, President Aoun uh, will have the advice from the army yes. how to act. Well, ladies and gentlemen, Egypt is uh, really making its stands uh, known for uh, the uh, Arab Asian countries. Started off with Beirut, started off with Lebanon, but there are other files as well, as uh, Dr. Amir mentioned, Tunisia and Jordan, also Saudi Arabia and Kuwait and the United Arab Emirates and Qatar. So Egypt is involved uh, quite heavily in the Asian continent and it is invited to participate in the Asia's interaction and confidence building measures. Let's check out this report and we'll be right back.
President Abdel Fattah Sisi has been rapidly drawing Egypt closer to Russia and China, which have been increasing their presence in the Middle East. Egypt has been strengthening its relations with Russia, especially in the military field. The formation of the Russian footholds in the Mediterranean region and north in Egypt includes the construction of a nuclear power plant in Daba, the construction of an industrial park of Russian companies on the east coast of Port Said. President Sisi has purchased Russian military equipment. Egypt signed an agreement with Russia to purchase 24 Su-35 aircrafts, which was delivered in the beginning of 2021. Russian products are being used in the security sector in Egypt through private companies linked to the military. China's presence in Egypt has also become prominent since President Sisi took office due to China's position as an economic power that does not use human rights as a pretext for political pressure and as an influential member of the international community. Since China agreed to comprehensive strategic partnership with Egypt in December 2014, China's investment in Egypt has picked up momentum with its direct investment increasing by 4.6 percent year-on-year in the first half of 2019. China's trade with Egypt in 2019 accounted for only 0.5% of its total exports and less than 0.1% of its total imports. Egypt's trade with China, on the other hand, accounted for 2% of the country's total exports, but 50% of its total imports, making China its largest importer. This relation, reflected in the mutual visits of the two leaders, President Abdel Fattah Sisi has visited China six times in a total as of June 2021, while President Xi Jinping visited Egypt only once in 2016. Currently, the two sides are strengthening bilateral relations through the implementation of several mega-projects by Chinese companies. A prime example is the new administrative capital, which is built 40 kilometers east of Cairo. Chinese companies are now playing a central role in the construction of facilities. They are in cooperation with local companies under the Egyptian military. Chinese companies will also be taking a leading role in the construction of a high-speed railway. The railway will connect the Mediterranean coast from Egypt, China, Suez Economic Trades Cooperation Zone along the Gulf of Suez by the administrative capital and New Cairo. The construction of the high-speed railway is expected to further increase China's presence in Egypt. Egypt also enjoys good relations with other Asian countries like North Korea, South Korea, Thailand, India and Pakistan in various domains and at all levels of cooperation, especially the economic one. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, continuing our discussion with Dr. Amir. Now, Doctor, you've mentioned that uh, Lebanon is really, um, it has a very strong Iranian presence, and mm. Iran has a presence uh, within the region as a whole, and uh, it's many countries and many different parts of the world are involved in the uh, Lebanese situation including Saudi Arabia as well that has its own issues with Yemen that has its own issues with Iran we've seen for a few years Egypt joining the Saudi led coalition fighting the Houthi uh, militias in Yemen with the developments taking place in Lebanon and quite recently as well Tunisia and Jordan how do you see this sort of uh, triangle or the, the direct sort of confrontation between Saudi Arabia and Iran, this conflict of ideologies and the battlegrounds that are existing elsewhere in the region, how do you see it maybe playing out? Well, um, I think that, that the American administration of Joe Biden is very confused about how to act and to to deal with the Iranian problem. Mm -hmm. They want to go fast in the uh, nuclear deal. Mm -hmm. And the EU wants that. But the allies of the United States in the Middle East are against that. Mm -hmm. Whether uh, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, uh, even we have seen King Abdullah of Jordan when he went to the States, he said, uh, had a very weird statement. He said, we were attacked by Iranian drones. Mm -hmm. This was the first time we heard that. We were attacked, and then he, he explained in a way or another, they said, well, they crossed our airspace and to attack Saudi Arabia, and, and he, but he said it, we were attacked. We, are, we were the target of Iranian drones. Mm -hmm. 
So Jordan also is not happy with that. Uh, the Gulf states. So all these, and of course Israel, all mm -hmm. these are the the hub uh, of America and the Middle East. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that uh, the main problem now for the Iranian uh, uh, government now is to try to go on in negotiating and gaining a territory and gaining time so sanctions would not destroy their government and then they will go on with their presence in the region. Mm -hmm. uh, for, for instance, the tanker, the oil tanker that I told you about yes. in the Gulf that was attacked by the Iranian drone, two citizens were killed, European citizens, in a board. Uh, it was in a, Br a British and a Romanian. Yes. The British didn't say a word. Mm -hmm. The Romanians, since yesterday, are making all their efforts, deploy their efforts to retaliate from Iran. They even called the ambassador of uh, Iran and they said on the public TV that Iran is behind it. So Iran uh, uh, um, called the, the Romanian ambassador mm -hmm. and then uh, Romania called the Iranian ambassador. Meaning. Yes. Yeah. And then they said, the Romanians, they said the following statement, we will take revenge and we are trying to see with our partners, meaning the EU, how to retaliate and we will retaliate. Mm -hmm. The EU is not really acting. Yes. They don't want this kind of confrontation. So Joe Biden a minute ago said, well, the attack against the oil tanker will be uh, we will we are preparing a um, collective response mm -hmm. so they have a problem and they do not know how to deal with this problem to negotiate with Iran and lose our allies or to confront Iran and they do not want this confrontation especially the EU doesn't want this confrontation mm -hmm. so I think that uh, what is taking place in the region now is, is, is a real confusion inside the U.S. administration. Mm -hmm. They do not know how to act. It was the mentality of uh, Barack Obama's administration, but it's not the same scenario, so they are incapable to act. For example, for instance, Antony Blinken, the Secretary of State, uh, before he, became, he uh, was appointed, uh, he used to criticize Egypt because he was from the Obama administration or the same field, let's say. And when he became Secretary of State's first visit, he came to Egypt and he has very good relations with President Sisi. Mm -hmm. They started to, uh, to, to realize that things on the ground have changed from 2011. It's yes. not the same situation. Mm -hmm. So they had a plan and the plan is not working. And then King Abdullah they tried to, to, to get rid of him. He made this visit to, to Washington and then Joe Biden, he said, well, and, and, uh, and the prince of, of Jordan was, was his father. Mm -hmm. And Joe Biden told him, I used to hang out with your father. And then they became, and he said, uh, King Abdullah, we said, he said, we are the allies of the United States. We will stand with the United States. So they didn't change anything in, uh, um, in Jordan. Then what took place in Tunisia, mm -hmm. they said, well, uh, the people, they are confused. Mm -hmm. So what we are witnessing now is a total confusion of the U.S. administration about the Middle East. They have several problems. They had the solutions, but the facts on the ground are totally different. The four years of uh, Donald Trump changed a lot. Yes, but with what you're saying, uh, it it sounds like Iran is not losing some of its power, but at least losing some of its uh, steam or the, some of its bite, if we may say. Do you think that can change things? Iran is being ske uh, squeezed inside Lebanon mm -hmm. and inside Syria, and Syria became a trap. But it's not um, losing ground in, uh, in Yemen. Mm -hmm. They're still threatening Saudi Arabia, and threatening Saudi Arabia with a level force. They can mm -hmm. attack the airports at any time. 
uh, they're still present in Bab and Mandab uh, Street. Uh, they could act at any time. Um, they showed the international community how they acted in the Gulf of Oman. Mm -hmm. So I think that the, the Iranians are still present because they have several communities, several businessmen working for them. They are strongly present in West Africa mm -hmm. with their Lebanese businessmen, but they're all Shia. Um, but the problem, the main problem for Iran is the inside now. And this mm -hmm. is the crisis. The country isn't that uh, strong economically. Politically, they are trying to act as a democratic country, but it's, uh, it won't be that easy because uh, we have seen things went out of control when, uh, in, in some parts lately and people were killed when they had shortage of electricity, shortage of water. Mm -hmm. Even there was this joke about they had this in, the, in Tehran uh, Square, there was this big clock for the timing of the downfall of Israel and when the electricity went down, the clock stopped. Mm -hmm. So everything, everyone said, well, uh, we have to restart again counting mm -hmm. <laughs> for the downfall of Israel. So uh, Iran is, is um, uh, the Iranian regime is facing its own people in the inside. Mm -hmm. um, they are trying to show the people that we have uh, power everywhere, regional power, but the, but the critics are saying inside Iran, no, you are financing terrorism. You are spending the money that we need for food, for medicine, uh, for to 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 stop these sanctions. We are trying to find electricity, water, and you're spending the money on the, uh, on Hezbollah uh, and and in Syria. You're funding the houses. Uh, you're funding the communities in Bahrain. So uh, they're not happy. Yes. And let's not forget that mainly the Iranian youth and and a huge number of them, they are more Persian in their heart than Islamic uh, souls as the mm -hmm. government. No, they have this thing that they have uh, the Aryan blood and they are Persians and whenever they will have the supremacy in the region it will be in the name of Persia, not religion. Mm -hmm. They do not war want to war because of religion. Yeah. So this is a huge problem between the government there and the young people. One final question because we're running out of time. You've pointed out to um, how does the U.S. administration feel about it, the European Union, uh, Romania, Saudi Arabia, Egypt. What about Russia? What, where do they stand? I mean, wh what's their say regarding the Iranian situation and maybe their influence on countries such as Lebanon? Well, as we all know, President Putin is watching and smiling. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, he knows, he, he, he calculates very well the situation and he doesn't get involved and he said it before, I'm not trying to be like the United States to force the control, mm -hmm. no, but he's creating uh, chaos. I remember uh, the Minister of Defense, Shuego, Sergei Shuego, he said it once, if the United States have several um, 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 the, the ships that have the the, the vessels, the the, the airplanes, mm -hmm. the carriers. Carriers. We have the means to, to destroy them. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily because you have carriers that we will make carriers. Yes. So I think that uh, Russia is very very clever in this game, controlling the situation. Yes. Well, ladies and gentlemen, as Dr. Amir mentioned, the. Uh, it is a very uh, complicated situation in the Asian countries, especially the uh, Arab Asian countries and definitely it needs a lot of diplomacy and Egypt's diplomacy has uh, never let us down and always uh, proved very successful, and very patient and very wise in dealing similar situations and hopefully the same will be uh, for this scenario. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have for this edition of the Daily Debate. But before we go, I'd like to thank my very distinguished guest, Dr. Sharif Amir, the Professor of Geopolitical Affairs at Paris University. Dr. Amir, always a pleasure having you with us. Thank you. Thank you very much, you. sir. Ladies and gentlemen, please stay tuned for more coming up on Nile International. I'm Haney Saif. Thank you for joining us.